Super Smash Brothers is a crossover game. We all know this by now, right? I mean, when you start the game up, the first thing you see after the long opening cinematic is the title screen. And my god, look at all the companies involved. That's 20 of them right there. And that's only for the playable characters, not even counting ones for stuff like spirits or music. Although it's not happening for this game specifically anymore, since DLC has wrapped up, new playable characters being announced is always a huge deal. When it happens, it's pretty much all you'll hear about that day. Hey, did you hear about Banjo and Kazooie being announced for Smash Brothers? Crazy, right? Man, please, I just want to get my coffee. And yeah, while it's all very exciting for us fans to see these characters join Smash's roster, I wanted to do something different from my usual content today, and just kind of talk about what I think it means in the grand scheme of things for a character when they get the esteemed honor of becoming an official Smash fighter, whether it's very much deserved or... deserved? I think the most influence Smash has had on any series is easily Fire Emblem. I mean, go to literally any Fire Emblem video posted on YouTube in the past 5 years, and I can almost guarantee you there's gonna be a Smash joke or reference somewhere in the video. It's a series where all the anime swordsmen and Smash Brothers are from. So yeah, I think Fire Emblem is a good place to start this video with. By the way, I love this channel, this wasn't a jab towards you, Captain Astronaut. Anyways, it's safe to say Fire Emblem goes hand in hand with Smash Brothers at this point. But why is that? Well, let's go in order of Smash games and discuss. Melee was the first one to have any Fire Emblem content in it, being Marth and Roy as playable characters, and out of every series represented on the roster, Fire Emblem was arguably the smallest one at the time, because F-Zero was still actually getting games at this point. However, Fire Emblem definitely wasn't a nothing series in Japan. You see, when Melee came out, how many Fire Emblem games do you think released outside of Japan? One? Two? How about zero? Players outside of Japan had absolutely no idea who these two blue and red haired dudes were, in fact, Roy's game, Fire Emblem The Binding Blade, hadn't even released anywhere in the world yet, so technically Roy is a Smash original character, not a Fire Emblem character. Uh, anyways, because of their inclusion in Melee, spreading the word about Fire Emblem, the sequel or prequel to The Binding Blade, namely The Blazing Blade on Game Boy Advance, would get a fully localized release outside of Japan, making it the first game in the series to be released worldwide, and also the best-selling game in the series at the same time. Think about that, Fire Emblem was a non-existent franchise outside of Japan, and thanks to Smash Brothers, it became a worldwide series, as every release after the Blazing Blade was also released outside of Japan, on top of getting a banger of a bestseller. And after that, the series kept going. Ike was included in the next Smash game alongside the return of Marth, but it honestly didn't do all too much for Fire Emblem. Ike's two games sold okay, but it was clear the series was just a passing fad. None of them ever sold remarkably well again, and each new game always did worse sales-wise than the one before it. But then, Fire Emblem Awakening came out in 2012, absolutely smashing the records of any previously sold game in the series. It's still a hotly debated topic among Fire Emblem fans if Awakening owes its success to Smash 4 including Robin and Lucina from the game. I'm not a Fire Emblem fan so I'm not gonna make any bold claims. But one thing that's undeniable is that Fire Emblem Awakening's huge success absolutely saved the franchise from cancellation since it was originally made to be the final installment in the series because of the previous games' lackluster sales and it might have Smash Bros. to thank for this newfound success. Smash famously went from having two Fire Emblem characters to six in Smash 4, with Marth, Ike, Lucina and Robin in the base roster and Roy and Corrin joining later as DLC. There was a very obnoxious time in the Smash fanbase where it seemed like every other week people were complaining about the amount of Fire Emblem characters in this game. And while I personally don't care, it did generate a lot of buzz around Fire Emblem, which undoubtedly helped make it more of a household name, because you know what they say, bad publicity is still publicity. Like I said, Corrin was a DLC character in this game, and somewhat like Roy's situation back in Melee, he was announced before his game even came out outside of Japan. In fact, his English name was confirmed to be Corin with his announcement trailer from Smash 4. Up until right here, he was only known under his Japanese name, Kamui. Corin was the second Fire Emblem DLC character in this game, and sixth one overall. And people were pissed. So pissed, in fact, that a few months later when Fire Emblem Fates released outside of Japan, they all went to buy his game upon release, making it the new best-selling game in the series. That worked? I'm not suggesting the only reason Fate sold so well is literally just because of Corrin's DLC inclusion in Smash, but Corrin was absolutely only added to promote this new game, which then ended up becoming the best-selling one. I really don't think it's too hard to put one and two together here. Also, a lot of characters got added to Smash to promote new games, I'm not saying Corrin is the only one, I'm just saying he's probably the most blatant example of this. 
Anyway, skipping ahead a bunch, Fire Emblem Three Houses gets announced, sells really well, gets a Smash DLC character in Ultimate, sells even better, and easily becomes the new best-selling game and most popular one in the series. So breaking it all down, Smash Brothers took a Japanese exclusive series that at one point started selling worse and worse, risking eventual cancellation, to a series that keeps getting more and more popular today, and having Nintendo's single highest grossing mobile game. Jesus Christ. That's how much Smash Brothers can do for the series, and we've only talked about Fire Emblem so far. I asked on Twitter if people have ever been introduced to a series they love through a character inclusion in Smash, and the answer was an overwhelming yes. Over 700 replies were just people saying how they fell in love with the series they first tried because of Smash Brothers, or even people saying they discovered entirely new genres of feeder games because of it. And overall, it was wonderful reading how so many people discovered new interests through the same game series. Smash is so powerful that even characters not joining the roster can help people fall in love with new games, which I thought was pretty funny. A lot of people said they got into Earthbound, Ness and Lucas' home series, because of Smash, even though Lucas's game specifically, Mother 3, has still yet to be officially released outside of Japan. But because the game has a huge cult following, likely because of Smash, Nintendo still gets pressured every year to finally localize the game. Come on, Reggie, give us Mother 3! How about this instead? There is an insanely popular fan translation of Mother 3, which is probably as popular as it is because of the game's continued representation in Smash. I mean, Lucas and Smash is what got me to play it, and it's a phenomenal game that deserves all the praise it gets and needs to be released worldwide already. Anyways, as fun as it was to read all these replies, I actually didn't need any convincing myself. Shulk's inclusion in Smash 4 is what got me to try Xenoblade Chronicles, which is now my favorite game of all time. Before that, my favorite game was The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker, which came out in 2002, and Smash 4 didn't release until 2014. So thanks to Smash, I discovered a game I love so much that it surpassed my favorite game ever, which held that title for 12 years. I honestly thought nothing would top it for the longest time. Speaking of which, Shulk's inclusion was a big deal too. Xenoblade only had one game at the time, and it had a... troubled history, to say the least. Let's just start at the beginning. Xenoblade was released in 2010 as a Japanese exclusive Wii game. Stop me if you know where this is going. It was planned to release in Europe as well, which it did a year later, but it wasn't planned to ever release in America, mostly because Nintendo of America had absolutely no faith in the game selling well at all. I won't bore you with the details, but eventually they folded thanks to a fan campaign called Operation Rainfall, which to this day I still can't believe was successful, and the game ends up releasing worldwide, getting critical acclaim and selling just shy of 1 million copies. Not too bad for a JRPG on the Wii. And then, I really don't understand why, but they decide to add Shulk, the main character of the game, to Smash 4, which confuses me a lot considering how adamant Nintendo of America was about not releasing it over there. Smash 4 entered development in early 2012, and that's likely also when the roster was finalized, and also around that time, Xenoblade finally released in America, so maybe Sakurai decided to add Shulk all the way back then to pressure Nintendo of America to not create another Lucas Mother 3 situation with any future Xenoblade entries. Anyways, baseless speculation aside, the year after Smash 4, Xenoblade gets two new games, Xenoblade Chronicles X on the Wii U and a port of the first game on new 3DS and likely because of the series' newfound popularity because of Smash, the games didn't sell that bad. I mean, they didn't sell fantastically or anything, but for a watered-down handheld port of a 2010 Wii game, and a weird open-world offline-ish MMORPG on the failure that is the Wii U, all in one of Nintendo's worst physical years ever, they didn't sell as bad as most people were probably expecting. And thanks to this, Xenoblade got a sequel in 2017, which, because it's a Nintendo Switch game, became the best-selling one in the series, and overall became way more popular, so much so that the first game got a substantial remake and another sequel all on the same console. So again, Smash took a series that at one point wasn't even planned to release outside of Japan and Europe because of how little faith Nintendo of America had in it, to one of their biggest RPG series that's getting game after game after game, has one of Nintendo's most anticipated games of the year, and is likely not slowing down anytime soon. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 just released and I haven't even started on it yet, but I have no doubts that it's probably going to sell the most copies out of all games in the series yet again. I'm not trying to say all Smash does is make series sell better and give them better chances. I mean, one of the things it does is make sure the character gets a cool little figurine. That's pretty cool. Jokes aside, this is going to sound mad corny, but I think the biggest thing Smash can do is bring people together and change lives for the better. I was born in 1999 and this video is being posted on my birthday, so I'm 23 now, and I had internet access as a kid, meaning I grew up on sites like Newgrounds and YouTube. 
playing flash games and watching stuff like equals three and smash Ugh. i was so influenced by this era of the internet that from a young age i knew i wanted to become a content creator and over the years i made a bunch of attempts to try and start a career on youtube Around 2008, I made a Rube Goldberg machine in my room that I wanted to post on YouTube, but couldn't because I didn't know how to. Around 2011, I made Minecraft Let's Play videos on my crappy laptop that couldn't record for longer than 20 seconds at most. And around late 2012, I made skits with my friends and brother that I recorded with my Nintendo 3DS. Needless to say, none of these were successful and also are all long deleted from YouTube, so don't go looking for them, they were horrible. But three years later, one of my friends found an Elgato capture card in a gamer store, and I asked to borrow it so I could make a video about a recently released game that I had been playing a lot, Super Smash Bros. for Wii U. I didn't know at all what I wanted to make, so I did the first thing that I came up with, and I made a video that's quite literally just me playing character voice clips found in the game. It's horrible. Around this time, I had an online friend group on Facebook and Skype, and in that friend group, we all just called each other by our Smash mains, so I was simply known as Jigglypuff. One of the people in said group randomly nicknamed me P. Jiggles one day as a rapper named Spin on Jigglypuff, since they were fans of rap music, and I decided to quickly take that name and make it a YouTube channel, because I didn't want anyone stealing that name and making a channel with it before I could. And this is literally the only reason I made that horrible first video, since I didn't want to have a YouTube channel with zero uploads. Around this time I was also a really big fan of the montages by KL, and especially Kid Retro, so I decided to make my own. I eventually got a small fanbase because of these videos, so I made a Discord server, which is where I met some people that I still talk to nowadays almost every day. And on the day this video goes up on YouTube, I'll be on vacation in America with them, meeting them for the first time after having known them all for almost 6 years. Nowadays, YouTube is my full-time job, which was my dream as a kid, and literally none of it would have been possible if not for Smash Brothers. I'm not one to get sentimental or emotional on public YouTube videos, that's not really my thing. I just want everyone to know that I wouldn't have gone to where I am now and wouldn't have met so many wonderful people in the community without this silly little crossover video game franchise. And I think that is the power of Smash. It would have been really impactful for me to end the video there, right? Well, like I said, this is my job now, so... Have you ever googled Cupcake once and gotten a billion different targeted ads for bakery stuff? Well, then data brokers have stolen your online information and sold it to scammers. Luckily, there's Incogni, the sponsor of today's video, who can help with that. Hackers steal the personal data of hundreds of thousands of people every day, and if all they do with it is sell it to companies that send you targeted ads, you're honestly lucky because they can just straight up change your credit score and basically ruin people's lives if they get the chance. It's pretty serious. These people know your full name, home address, phone number, relatives, IP address, education history, you name it. Luckily, you're legally allowed to request them to delete this information of yours, but good luck finding them. They have dozens of loopholes to avoid you doing this, and it's a lot of confusing legal hassle to do so. This is where Incogni steps in. They can essentially force data brokers to delete all info they have about you with a bunch of legal stuff that's too hard for me to figure out. But they are experts on it. What's cool about this service is that you get live updates of everything going on, so you can see how many hackers have your data, or more accurately how many still have it, since Incogni will make sure that number drops to zero. They're basically an awesome guardian angel that protects you non-stop, and the first 100 people to use my special code PJIGGLES at the link in the description will get 20% off their entire service. And yes, you heard me right, it's only for the first 100 people, so be quick about it. Online protection is very important, so I want to thank Incogni for giving me this opportunity, so definitely be sure to check it out at the link in the description. See what I mean? Smash Brothers allowed me to get cool brand deals like that. Special thanks to the Game Didi, Free Friends, Sayalola, LurFX1, Quote is Cool, Lime the Chef, Kirk, Right the Yoshi, Giant Firing Cole, The Flying Fire, Louis, Noso, Casper Wenning, and the rest of my awesome Patreon supporters. This video was actually made because it won a poll on my Patreon, so if you want a hand in deciding another video in the future, go check out my page. Because of how different this video is, it's probably not gonna do so well on YouTube, so if you want to help, you can do so by leaving a like and a comment, as that makes the video more likely to appear in people's recommended. And while you're at it, why not subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks so much for your continued support, thanks to Sakurai and the whole Smash team for making Smash Brothers, and I hope you have a great day.